Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Warm greeting, anyone who's visiting, grateful to have you with us. I pray you'll be encouraged and blessed in our time uh, together this morning. We get to worship God in spirit and truth through the word now. So we will continue our worship in Philippians chapter 3. If you'll turn there with me, I'm going to begin reading in verses 1 through 9. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, and beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I far more, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law of Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church, and as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish, so that I might gain Christ." And I might be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Let's go to our God. Father, these are rich words, and I pray now that you will take them and you'll feed your people. God, I pray that the saints of God would be fed on these. I pray that no one would walk out of this room without being able to declare, I count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I pray for any who have walked in here that don't know Christ. I pray today they would throw down all these vain things that charm them most. I pray that they would sacrifice it all to the blood of Christ this morning and they would fall and believe on Christ and surrender to him. God, there are a million needs this morning. I pray that you meet them all through the word of God by your spirit. Lord, bless us in these words, I pray. Amen. We've been looking at this section as a call to joy. Paul is seeking to be a minister for our joy. All other joys will be fleeting. All other joys will be up and down based on circumstances. What Paul is presenting to us is we have an unchanging joy. We, we have to have an unchanging relationship with God in a certain future to have an unchanging joy. And that's what this gospel gives to us. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And we saw there are hindrances in our journey to our joy. And they were legalism. He told us to beware of these false teachers. And I want to make sure you don't miss this because we don't have a lot of Jews trying to get us to be circumcised and keep the Mosaic law in our day. But what we do have is a lot of manure called Jesus plus something equals acceptance with God. There's a hundred different lies out there to even this morning. Baptism will save you. Church membership, a victorious life, great marriage, perfect kids, church attendance, speaking in tongues, being a part of a certain denomination. The list goes on and on and on. And they will never go away till Christ comes back. So beware as it will steal your joy. Don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back under this lie and false teaching. And then he said, here are the helps to then to our joy in verse three. We're the people who worship in the spirit of God. We worship from the inside now because the gospel has changed our hearts. And what just took place was a church worshiping God for what he's done in Christ. Tozer said the church that cannot worship must be entertained. And the men who cannot lead a church to worship must provide the entertainment for them. And so may Christ be worshiped in this church and may we all glory in him alone and look to him alone for our acceptance with God. And will we have no confidence in the flesh, nothing in me that will ever turn God's heart towards me. If, if we get into legalism, joy will always be elusive until it's anchored in the righteousness of Christ But I want you to hear this. It's put to your account by faith and not by the works 
of the law. Performance for God's forgiveness and relationship is a death blow to your joy. You'll, it'll just be fleeting. You'll never be able to hold it. Nothing has ever killed my joy more than picking little flower petals saying, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. If I have a great day in the Lord, I think I can sleep better because I have his acceptance. And if I have the worst day of my life, he doesn't care for me, I'm a waste of his time and I can't sleep. This is big what we're going to look at this morning. And so last week we hit pure gold. We looked at the gospel in all of its simplicity and purity. We looked at it by the way of a resume. And we looked at a resume as holding up your little list of all your accomplishments and what you have done to get you into college, a career, a relationship, or your own acceptance of yourself. And Paul held up his resume of all that he did as to what would open the door to to him to God. And I would say it's the best resume that I've ever seen. And I think that's a gift from God for anyone hoping this morning to improve your resume to get in. There's not a better resume. And I want you to hear uh, what Paul says about his resume. Because too many sit in the church trying to refine their resume. We want other people to see our resume and we want God to approve it so the door will be opened. And that is the opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said his resume didn't lead him to God. It actually led him away from God. And I want you to hear that. All your efforts, all your work, all your improvement, all the classes and seminars led you away from God if you were looking at it for your acceptance. Your sobriety, your purity, your morality, your church attendance, all of your Bible reading and improvement, your, 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 whatever it was that you were looking for led you away from God, not to him. You just don't hear that in our country. That is the opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Name whatever you want, whatever was on your resume, it led you away from your God. Name it, anything that you did to earn favor and approval with your God led you from him. Paul said it's loss. That Greek word is manure, it's refuge, it really meant pig poop. Just, that's all it is. My resume is a big picture of pig poop. And yet we just keep getting out our little shovels and we scoop it up again and again and again and smile and bring it back to God, different kind of poop, and say, God, don't you love me now? Don't you approve me more because of this kind of manure? And no matter how good your offering is, no matter how good your effort, no matter how much growth, everything you lift up to God for acceptance is manure. And the only way that you will ever be able to admit this and say everything I've ever done my whole life has led me away from God is by the Holy Spirit. You will never be able to admit it. And it's been a little too long since I quoted Rocky you, there's too many new people that you need to hear this. And I think it was Rocky too. I can't remember if the manager was dead or alive. But anyways, um, Adrian, his wife, says, Rocky, why are you going to fight the champ? He almost killed you. And, and Rocky says, I got to prove that I'm not a bum. And I believe the whole gospel is us trying to build a resume to prove we're not a bum. And we want the whole world to know it. So to look in the mirror and say, I'm a bum, cannot happen apart from the Holy Spirit because your whole house of cards will fall. Your whole resume will break. And so only the Holy Spirit can bring you to this place where where you look in the mirror and you say, I'm the biggest bum who ever lived, but I'm more loved than I could have ever hoped, dreamed, or imagined. Your bootstraps have to break before the gospel can break in. Until you stand poor in spirit before your God with nothing to bring to merit his favor or acceptance and cry out, alms for the poor, have mercy on me, the sinner, you'll never be able to enter into the kingdom of God. And this one who can stand up and walk walk away by faith with the resume of Christ, you can walk away with God now looking as if you live the life that Jesus Christ has lived. You could be in a right standing with God this morning through Christ and Christ alone. 
You'll be joined to Jesus Christ in a marriage as we've learned this whole morning. And now he will be your representative head. He will be the only reason you can ever be accepted by God is because you are now in a relationship with Christ and God treats you as if you died the death that Jesus died and you lived the life that Jesus lived. And the way you receive this is not by works, but by empty hands that cry out for Christ alone. Did you think of a better message than that? It's all of Christ and none of me. I glory in Christ, not in me. God asks that I bring nothing but an empty hand. I need to come with my demerit and receive his merit. I need to come with nothing and leave with everything. Come with your unrighteousness and leave clothed in his righteousness. Have you had this transaction or are you just religious? Has this happened in your life is where we're going to drive this morning. He gets all the glory because salvation belongs to our God. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And I just sit here and I'm like, Paul, put down your pen and close the letter. Sincerely, Paul. What, what do you say after that? Then close the letter. And then comes these words this morning that I want every one of us to hear. Holy Spirit, let us hear. Give us ears. Verse 8. More than that. More than that. And I'm like, Paul, the Mona Lisa is finished. Why do we put another stroke on it? More than that. More than what? More than what? Well, what we just went over. That everything you've ever done in your life to get favor with God is manure, and now I can get gain by looking to Christ alone. And you get right with God through that. And he says, more than that? Christ didn't just change the way that I view my righteousness. He didn't just tear up my resume of manure. He did something more. He said, more than that. And that's probably what American Christianity needs to hear more than anything else. This is what my heart needs to hear more than anything else. More than that. We want to paint this gospel of Philippians 3, 1 through 7 and say, that's it. That's it. I'm right with God. I, I, I can go live any way I want. Nothing else matters. And in many places, we don't even get that part right. But a whole reformation happened to get Philippians 3, 1 through 7 right. Luther's whole born again experience is when he realized the righteousness that God wants, he gives to me by grace through faith. So the gospel doesn't end there. It does more than that. It is a light shining into your hearts and minds. Your eyes are open. You have a whole new accounting of what is gain and what is loss. You look at these verses, gain, loss, gain, loss, manure, gain. So you get a whole new way of looking at life. This is what the gospel does to a human being. More than that. I have a whole new way now of looking at all of life. It's not just my resume, but everything that I thought that would bring me life in this world, everything that I thought was going to satisfy me, what would finally make me happy and whole and content, what I need for life to be worth it. Many look to religion and church to, give, to get God to give them these things, to bless them in their jobs and their family and their health and their prosperity. It's jammed in our churches and it sits here this morning and we just hide it a little better because we don't put it on our, on our billboards as you walk in. We have a whole new re religion in America and it doesn't have a more than that. It's just got Philippians 3, 1 through 7 if they get that right. Ours is that's it. That's, we got our fire insurance. We're going to go to heaven. Let's go live any way we want. Isn't this great? <laughs> Look at my fire insurance. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. I can live this life without the dreaded fear of what happens at the end of it. I got everything. I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. Let's ride. We build social clubs, kids programs, entertainment to keep us happy in this little life. And, and, and I have just spent the week in deep examination and prayer and asking myself, and I want to ask you, do I have more than that? Because Paul, this isn't just for super apostles, for every believer. More than that. 
Can I sing the hymn we just sang? All those vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. I pray you get what Paul is saying this morning. More than that, the gospel also does something to my accounting about the rest of my life here on earth. It causes me to look at it completely different than I did before salvation. And so will you gaze with me in verses 7 through 8? But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. <clears throat> More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ. And I hope it, it jumps out to you like it did to me. You just have a new way of thinking about what is loss and what is gain. What, what is manure and what is surpassing value? The eyes are opened to see life in a whole new and different way. And so let's dig in. I, I've prayed that God would give everyone in the sound of my voice a more than that this morning. I want you to be able to say it and not be a hypocrite. Let's pray again. Father, please grant more than that. God, let our eyes be opened to this glorious gospel and let it have its work in every mind and heart. Let nothing block what you're doing this morning in this word, I pray. Amen. So more than that, but even more also, Paul says, as I look at anything now, it's loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. It doesn't mean that everything's bad. It just means it's lost now compared to this knowing Christ. The Christian not only has a new accounting in his righteousness or goodness, but again, toward everything and all of life, I have a, no, a whole new perspective. I have a whole new way of accounting for my existence. All that was gained to me, everything that I've ever counted as important and valuable my whole life, suddenly it's loss. That's what the gospel does to a heart. It's a new birth. You are birthed into the spiritual realm and you can see now. It's what drove me for 21 years of my life now is manure. My eyes are open and all the things that charmed me most, I'm now holding a pile of manure going, this isn't it. That isn't what, what, what controlled every single thought and everything that I did is just dead. Last Saturday during Entrench, Laura's parents were out of town and I, it was just me the whole day in communion with God. And as I sat there just dwelling with him, everything else just felt like loss. Nothing can make me that joyful and peaceful and content. I've chased so many things in my life and they're all fleeting joys and fleeting pleasures. But knowing him just, just, just keeps growing and deepening and getting sweeter and bringing more peace and more joy than anything. All that was at the center of my life as to what was valuable to me, it's all gone. And there's this one thing in the center circle, Jesus, knowing him. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, Paul says, is the one thing. Nothing else has ever satisfied my heart like him. Every lie that has ever been held up to me that promised to satisfy me more than him has brought less peace and less joy and the most fleeting pleasure. Because of my new accounting, I just can't enjoy sin any longer. Anything held up to the light that Paul saw on Damascus was loss. It's now manure. And it's not because the world's so bad. It's because Christ is so good that it just eclipses. The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So what hit me this week, this doesn't look like plan B. It's not just for those who really want to be zealous. It's not only for apostles. Please hear, it's what happens to believers. And, and what you're going to see is not perfect. And a few more verses, Paul's going to say, it's not that I'm perfect. 
So I just want you to get that no one's got this perfect. But what has happened, Paul says, is my pursuit is one thing. I pursue in verse 14 and 13 and 14, one thing, Christ. Ground zero for me with no temptation, what I want, give me Jesus. And the flesh remains and all that other stuff that I think will make me happy, just there's a war. And we got a Roman 7 battle that goes on in this fight. And I like cheesy illustrations. I don't know if you do, but this is cheesy. I don't know why it helped me, but it did. When I was a little kid, I had this bike. Unfortunately, it was yellow. It's not my favorite color. Um, And one day I saved up my allowances, and I, I had this little round seat. And if you rode it long enough, it hurt. So I bought a green banana seat. Any older people know about the banana seats? Um, And I had a little card that made it make noise when the spokes went around. It was really cool. So I loved my bike, and I rode it everywhere. That was our entertainment at Seven Boys. Our only entertainment was, here's your bike. And and then it happened. My sixth grade birthday. Is mom here? Oh, tell her I love her. Her and dad bought me a 10-speed red Schwinn bike. And that old yellow bike got eclipsed by something greater, and I never rode it again. I think I gave it to Timmy. (laughs) Nothing changed on that bike. So I'm trying to say, it wasn't bad. The the world, I'm not trying to say everything about it's bad, but next to the Schwinn, I was lost. And this is getting at the very heart of being a Christian, because I just see people who say, I love this world, I just want to drink it up but I don't want to go to hell. I don't don't want to go to hell when I'm done, so I'm going to make myself not do this. I don't don't want to do what I really want to do because I'm a Christian. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it fills our land. It misses it. Paul is saying you have found something of such value that everything else is manure in comparison. It's not, I wish I could drink all these things up, but I don't want to go to hell. That is not it. It's the comparison that makes it lost. Jesus Christ is my treasure, my value, my hope, my everything. And everything else pales in comparison to Christ. He's gain. That's what makes everything else lost to me. And this may grow. You might have seasons that it diminishes. It's a fight of faith. But it's a present tense verb. Keep counting it. Fight for this. It's there in principle in every believing heart. You know what? Let's turn to a couple verses. Turn to Matthew. I think for the sake of time, just go to Matthew 13. And when you go home, read Matthew 16, 25 through 26. We'll just do one this morning. And this is one of my favorites. Matthew 13. (coughs) Here's what Paul's talking about. He's, He's taking it from what Jesus taught us. And in verse 44 of Matthew 13, this is Jesus. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found, and he he hid it again. And from joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has to buy that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, He went and sold all that he had so he could buy it. And so the kingdom of God is when you see this value, it's Jesus, and he alone can save. I'll give up everything that I might have Christ. I'll sell it all because I just want Jesus. And that's what the kingdom of God is, is Christ, your accounting is so different now. He is the value. He's the pearl of great price. And he's the treasure hidden in a field. And I'll give up everything that I have, that I might have Christ. In Matthew 16, he says, he who wishes to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life will find it. So the one who lives for this world and all its treasures, you will lose your life. And the one who loses his life when he gets Jesus will gain it. Same words that Paul's using. This is the heart of a Christian. I have found something that's better than all of my righteousness, all of my privilege, all of my practice, all of my possessions, 
all of my desires, all of my goals and ambitions. I have found that which can save my soul, my eternal soul that's going to live forever. That's got to be more valuable than looking at some gross stuff on the internet or chasing this world for what it could ever. That's got to be better than anything else. I found that which can save me. And I prize it over all else. This alone is my treasure. I'm going to live with God forever in perfect paradise because of Christ. That's my treasure. Do you have that accounting? That's the key to keep that treasure sparkling through the means of grace. Keep it before you. And what I want you to see, my journey, you know what, you know what hurts the luster of that? Sin. Sin makes Jesus in your mind not luster the way it should. It puts cataracts. It puts a veil over you. And the other thing is idols. These idols of the heart that you begin to want more than Jesus, they take away the luster and they start competing. And that's how you know it's sin and it's lostness and and indwelling sin and all that we're battling. Because what could compete with Jesus? How could having someone in the church think I'm really cool and be willing to do anything to have that acceptance compare with Jesus Christ? This is what happens with sin and idolatry. And so we got to keep putting to death by the Spirit the deeds of the flesh. But I just want you to, to get that idolatry, these idols of the heart, keep us from seeing the glory and the beauty of Christ where more than that, doesn't flow out of your heart and your lips. And I've just been journeying and learning idols that were hidden. And as God is smashing them, Christ has never been more beautiful. And so I want you to to really get counseling, help, whatever you need. The idols of your heart are why you're not sitting here this morning just going more than that. I have Christ. And there's competition because of these idols and your sin and what you're wanting over Christ. I'm thinking of the rich young ruler. He comes up to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus gives them all the commandments except one. He doesn't give the one, do not covet. And the guy says, I've kept all these. So he's like, Paul, my righteousness is blameless. Okay, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor because he's a covetous man. And Jesus goes right to his heart and he says, there's something that you love more than me. Go sell it all and give it to the poor. And he says he went away sad because Jesus wasn't a treasure hidden in a field. And so there's things here this morning that you won't give up. You won't walk away. You'll go away sad because those are the idols and the things that you want more than Jesus. The church is full of people who need to go away sad. We've let you have your idols in Jesus and say, we got Philippians 3, 1 through 7, everything's okay and it's not true. But the bar was raised to where you could have all your idols and sin and Jesus as well and live happily ever after. And I'm standing on that. I'm trying to crush it this morning for your joy. Your joy is going to come from these idols being smashed and Jesus being everything. (laughs) This is where joy is found. So I'm stepping on your toes to make you happier than you've ever been because these idols are stealing your joy. And so I'm going to say it as plain as I know how. Have you come to see Jesus as a pearl? Can you look at your children this morning, your spouse, your family, your house, your bank account, your body, your appearance, your clothes, your hobbies, your accomplishments, your approval? Can you look at all those things and say, I count them but loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord? For me to live... Christ. God in his goodness will do a Philippians 1 6. He who began a good work will complete it to make sure that we keep growing in this. So I want you to hear this. God's going to touch your competing loves. He is going to touch your idols to not destroy you and make you miserable. He's going to come in to break them so that you'll find more of Christ, more joy, and more peace. I promise you, He's not sinking you and dunking you underwater to make you miserable, but so you'll behold more of the glory of Christ. What a, what a God. 
who will do this in each one of our lives. He'll take from our fingers that which competes with Christ. That is why he disciplines us for our good. So that Philippians 3.8, we won't drift from more than that. Most of the pain you're feeling, carrying, enduring this morning is the love of God leading you deeper into the love of Christ and knowing him. Not every trial, but a lot of them are for this. To bless you and not make you miserable. I've had to let family go. I've had a season where I had to let go of my health, security, and money. The last couple years, he broke the idol of ministry, reputation, and I learned that I'm more of a bum than I'd ever thought. And I stand here to say more than that, I count all things but rubbish that I might gain Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, let them take away anything this morning that's competing with Christ. Ask them. Beg them to do it. Anything that's blocking the luster and the beauty of Christ from your eyes, let them rip it away. It hurts so bad, but you're going to be blessed beyond compare. And some of you right now are like Jacob wrestling with God. No, I want this. I want my health. I want my family. I want this. And you're wrestling him, and God's going to put your hip out, so just do it. Don't don't walk around limping with a broken hip. Just say uncle this morning. (laughs) God, you get everything. But you're wrestling him with your idols. And you're fighting God. And it's stealing your joy and your peace. And so anything that's blocking that, rip away, Lord. To where I'll say with Hudson Taylor and Adoniah Judson, they said they went to China and Africa and all this talk of my sacrifice. He says, I've never sacrificed anything for the Lord. When you get this, everything, you lose your life. It's not a sacrifice. I get to give everything to Jesus. I love that. If, if, I, if, if the whole realm of nature was mine, I'd sacrifice it to you, God. I'd give you anything. I, w- I wish I had so much more to give to Christ. And that's the greatest joy that you have now because of this treasure and this pearl. Here's my life. God, I give it to you. One life to live. It'll soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You you gave your son for me. I'll give everything because of the gain that I have in Jesus Christ. Your eternity is set, secure. Nothing can be taken away. Why why are we dangling these little things that are going to make me happy? I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. (laughs) So it's not even so much that he saves you, but he joins you to himself in a vital relationship. You are brought into a relationship with Jesus, and there is the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. You're married to him. You're in communion. Union and communion. That is better than everything that I ever treasured or held to. And I'm holding to something now that far surpasses what I ever held before. That's how you know your eyes have been opened. Knowing. That Greek word is not so much intellectual, but experiential or personal involvement with. Peter said to Jesus in in John 21, he says, you know that I love you, Lord. And he used the word of this experiential knowledge. You've walked with me. We've been together for three years. You know this. It's a very personal knowledge. Learning of him in the word, praying, experiencing his power, fellowship in his sufferings. This is a a relationship. So, So three, one through seven was a legal transaction where the righteousness of Christ is put to your account. And three, eight is you are joined in a living relationship to Jesus Christ. And that relationship now is more value and better than anything that you've ever held, possessed, dreamed of, or hoped in. That's the Christian life. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. My best asset. That is what I would trade anything for. This is the only way you'll ever battle competing desires. To keep yourself in the love of Christ. The reason we don't overcome sin is because they're they're on the same plane. And when Christ is in the right place, sin becomes manure and loss 
and not so beautiful and not so tempting. Repentance and faith is the Christian life. So we can be taken away by the world. I want you to hear this. Believers can get taken away by the world. That's why this is being exhorted. We'll be brought back to our senses by the Spirit, and you'll always repent and come back to this ground zero of Christ. I can't get over the gift of repentance. What a gift to turn back and be right with God from our competing idols. So you know what I really like about this passage? This is not a guy having his fingers wrenched off of what he was holding to. And sometimes I watch that. But it's a guy who says, everything that I ever loved, sought and hoped in, was rubbish. I just want to gain Christ. And this is not a guy weeping of everything that he has to leave behind. The gain has made the old gain to be loss. It's, it's not tears like, I got to leave all this behind. I get to leave all this. This was manure. Hey, God is so good to open your eyes so that repenting for the first time, leaving everything in this life and world is not tears and sorrows that I got to leave that. I get to leave that garbage. And I get to come to Christ and get gain and have him. My eyes have been opened. I don't live any longer for the scene where, where everything was gain in this world. But now I have the unseen God and the unseen Christ. That's my new treasure, my new pearl. So in summary, to know Christ fully compensates for the loss of all things. I promise you, you'll never feel cheated. You'll never think you got a raw deal. This is the freest, most joyful life, the exchanged life of giving up all things that I might have Christ. There is nothing more joyful or satisfying than what Christ offers. Come to me and I will give you this. So one last question and we'll close. Um, gain Christ? What, what comes to your mind? I, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of gain, I gotta go work at this. <laughs> I gotta go work to get Christ. I wanna gain him. I want, to win, I want to earn him. And that's the first thought when I hear gain, but, but come look with me at verse 9, because I think Paul wants to protect against that. What's the gain? That I might be found in him, in Christ. And in Christ, I have a righteousness, uh, not a righteousness of my own derived from the law, my resume. That isn't what got me there. But that which is through faith in Jesus Christ and that faith in Christ gives me the righteousness which comes from God. It's a God kind of righteousness that comes to me on the account of faith. I don't know how many times you can say faith in one verse. Not by works, but by faith. The, the righteousness, the God kind of righteousness that he requires to be in his presence is given to me. And it's put to my account. That's gain. And I want to show you something awesome that the Lord showed me this week. Um, it's called a Christ sandwich. <laughs> Just look at verse 8. Here's the meat. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, that I might gain Christ. The pearl, the treasure, this is Christ. This is, this is my, my new accounting. Everything's lost compared to Christ. And now I want you to look at the bread because verse seven is the first slice of bread, wonder bread. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. So all my righteousness that I thought was getting me gain, manure. And now I get the righteousness of God to my account. And, and so then, I, in my mind, I think verse 9 explains verse 7. And I think Paul should have said 7 and then verse 9. And then verse 8. But there, he didn't. And he's led by the Holy Spirit, praise God. So I want you to see, I think what he's doing is these pieces of bread are the exact same thing that you get gain. And the gain of Christ is that you get his righteousness put to your account, not by works, but by faith. So I gain Christ by doing nothing, by bringing nothing, 
by, by looking to Christ and believing this gospel, empty hands, calling out, crying, save me. And so I just want you to see when you get that you literally stand before God this morning accepted and approved, because 80% of you, I bet, are sitting here with some kind of works thinking, I just, God doesn't love me this morning. I just, it's just messing with you. And so Christ is not a treasure. He's not more than that. There's competing desires because I don't believe that I'm sitting here this morning wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ in him. Oh my. Do you, I want you to hear this one thing, brothers and sisters. Every believer in this room, this very second, hear this. You cannot be more loved by God. It's infinite right now. You cannot be more accepted than you are this morning by God. You could not be more forgiven for every sin that you've ever committed than right now. You could not be more righteous before God than you are this morning. You could not be more justified. God has said you're not guilty. You could be no more justified than you are this morning. You could be no more united to Christ than you are this morning. And I want you to hear this. If you were to die this very hour and stand before God, you would receive the full reward of Christ forever and heaven forever. If you just right now drop dead, you would stand before God faultless before his throne. Right now, the Ken Murphy record, when I look at my debits of sin, there's none. And some of you know me and you're like, that rascal has sin in that account. Right, Laura? <laughs> Kels? It, it, it's true. You look in my account for sin, it's empty. <laughs> How? Well, God legitimized it to Christ's account and he put him up on a cross and he punished him there for every sin that I've ever done. There's not a sin in my account. And then my righteousness account, and I know some of you know me, say so there's not much. There is. Do you know what's in my account this morning? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Not for my account, yours. If we got that, we would say more than that, I count all things to be lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I just want to read to you in closing John Bunyan's conversion. He wrote The Pilgrim's Progress in the 1600s. One day as I was passing into the field, this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And me thought, <laughs> withal, I saw with the eyes of my soul Jesus Christ at God's right hand. And there, I say, was my righteousness. So that wherever I was or whatever I was doing, God could say, God could not say of me, he wants or he lacks my righteousness. For that was, that was just before him. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that my, made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and from my irons. The righteousness that God requires is seated at his right hand in Jesus Christ and he raised him from the dead to show that he's that righteousness. And by faith, he puts that to my account and now I stand just before this God. My life was trying to gain it. Gospel broke in, it's a gift. And what we get in Christ has made everything else lost. I cannot believe what we have in Christ. Is this the great gain of your life or is it just another thing that you're adding to your life? Will you build a life around this or will you build on loss, manure, which is sinking sand? What are you building on this morning? 
And so I want to close with John Newton with a hymn that he wrote, and it's not Amazing Grace. It's called Where is Boasting Then? And I believe he wrote it from Philippians 3, 8, and 9. No more, my God, I boast no more of all the duties that I have done. I quit the hopes I held before to trust the merits of thy son. Now for the love I bear his name, what was my gain I count my loss. My former pride I, sh I call my shame, and I nail my glory to his cross. Yes, and I must and will esteem all things but loss for Jesus' sake. Oh, may my soul be found in him and of his righteousness partake. The best obedience of my hands dares not appear before thy throne, but faith can answer thy demands by pleading what my Lord has done. So as we close, we're out of time, so you don't get my application, but I'll give you a couple. Church of God, here's the key to fight sin, Christ's beauty. It's the only way I've ever been able to put sin to death is when I have a greater pleasure than what sin presents to me. Keep this treasure before you and let us encourage each other in the treasure day in and day out. And community, I need to see my idols because some of them are hidden. Get in the body and help each other see the idols that are killing you. And then have friends. God, search me, oh God. Show me my heart. Get in counseling. Get discipleship. Be humble. You know what the best thing you can do is make it easy for people to tell you you have idols. Instead of, I ain't, I ain't touching that baby. I've seen people touch it and I know what happens. Be humble. Let, let, let them come touch them and show them so Christ can have more luster in your eyes. And so this is beautiful. I think I know what heaven's going to be like. I've had some times with the Lord where it was joy beyond all comparison, and I've never wanted to leave his presence. And it's going to be that on steroids for all of eternity. May eternity begin right now in our hearts and flesh. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice to thy blood. Will all be gone for all of eternity, all my temptations. And I'm going to spend eternity basking in my treasure and my pearl Forever and ever and ever, that's the new accounting that God has given to us. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for the heart of the Apostle Paul and what the Holy Spirit did to his accounting. One who once would kill Christ would now die for him. One who was so proud of his righteousness now realizes the whole thing was manure. Oh God, may we look to Christ and in him find the God kind of righteousness that you require. God set believers free that are having a hard time working that out in day-to-day -day life from past hurts and past rejections. God, there's so many things uh, that fight against delighting in the beauty and the glory of this righteousness. So Holy Spirit, break through. Break through whatever pain hurts uh, misunderstandings, God, let them see this morning the one who looks away from anything in self and looks to Christ has this righteousness in their account. And let them see the way you got rid of our sin wasn't blowing it away, but it was putting it on your son and piercing him through for our transgressions. God, let that take up hearts to see Christ as a pearl, as a treasure, and that we would give up everything in this world to have Christ. God, let him outshine all competing desires. And let me give my life, my soul, my all to this beautiful, sweet Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.